Stanford University. Hello? Hello? Um, welcome to the first lecture of spring 2010-2011 W380. If you're taking the, this class for credit, all assignments are done online via we380.stanford.edu. Assignments consist of writing a few sentences that convince us you watched and understood the talk. Uh, passing consists of 10 such assignments, uh, and we don't give incompletes because nobody ever finishes. Um, you can watch online, but if you do, I guarantee you're going to miss something every week. Um, that's the way it goes. There's a trend in computer design. Um, there's a trend wheel in computer design. In recent years, GPUs and more specialized processing engines have taken an unassailable lead. Um, <laughs> well, today's talk by Victor Lee of Intel is about how general purpose processors are, once again, fighting back. <laughs> I see. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Victor Lee from Parallel Computing Lab, Intel. Uh, I don't control the volume. I think they do. Maybe it is an on-off station. Did you? No, no, no. No, no. It'll be Just say operator volume. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can you hear me better now? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Good. Voice control. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm part of Parallel Computing Lab. Uh, which is part of Intel Labs. So what we do is uh, bring research to realization. Take and the phone out of your pocket, please. Hmm? Oh, okay. <laughs> Take the phone out. Okay, that's lesson number one. <laughs> okay, so in our group, our focus is parallel computing. That's the name in Pies. And we actually have two charters. One is looking <coughs> at the application-driven architecture research. We spend a lot of time working with ISV, um, working with academia, looking at what is the emerging application, because we believe that um, application is truly what drives the architecture development. Um, and then the second part of our charter is really to um, look at product interception. Um, we've been driving multi-core and many-core architectures into Intel products, and we look at, we bring these research ideas into actual product ideas. So in terms of workloads, um, so as I said, we have a dual charter, and we look at workloads and we look at architectures. In terms of workloads, some of the emerging applications that we looked at are like uh, multi-model simulations, behavioral simulation, um, medical imaging, large-scale optimization, um, a lot of the HPC applications. And we do col collaborate with industry and academia. And I listed some of our collaborators there. In terms of architecture focus, now, after we study about these emerging applications, what do we do? Uh, we quickly, <coughs> after we understand it, we're trying to map them to today's current architecture and trying to understand why they do well and why they don't do well. And from there, then we identify a few of the architecture issues and trying to solve them. And I think number one issue that we're looking at today is feeding the bees. As we increase the compute capability, the memory subsystem don't <coughs> seems to catch up. And we would definitely have a big challenge there, and I will talk more about it in my later part of my talk. Um, other type of researches we spend time on are like unstructured accesses, um, domain-specific accelerations, um, massive threaded uh, machines. Now, some of the accomplishments we have in the last couple of years are like um, on one of our many core processor prototype, we achieved a teraflop SDAM in 2009. And we actually get to the fastest single chip um, LU Limpact um, performance last year. And some of the, the other thing we'll be looking at fastest um, search sort, um, relational join type of database behavior that we actually published this year as well. That was a question? By SGM, you mean sparse This is dense. So Sorry? Th this is dense. SGM is dense? Yes. Dense, this is a single precision matrix, matrix, yeah. So this is a blast three routine. Yeah, so there will be a sparse version, but the things that we, we, we demonstrated in 2009 was a dense version. So why would you do a sparse version? 
I mean, there will be a sparse problem that needs matrix matrix multiplications. I mean, there. Out of curiosity. I mean, there are a lot of domain-specific optimization problems that are sparse. And in there, if you need to do matrix-matrix <coughs> multiplication, then you will need a sparse version of it. Uh, um, sorry, I have personal interest in it. I'm just curious if there's a good problem with a sparse matrix-matrix. I, I haven't seen a compelling one myself, but I'm young, I don't know a lot. Okay, fine, let me move on. Okay, so that's enough introduction to our group. And so now let's move to today's topic about parallel computing. So there are a few motivations why we think parallel computing is eminent and also very important. The first one is the exponential growth of digital devices. I mean, in the last 20 years or so, I mean, digital devices become much more prominent and I'm sure almost everybody here has a cell phone with a digital camera. And what that means is, because of these kind of digital devices, you start capturing large amount of digital data. And once you have huge amount of data, then the next logical question is, how do you process them and how do you handle them? So the next motivation of parallel computing is the popularity of the World Wide Web. I mean, since the 90s, um, it really changes the way people use the computer. I mean, especially the demographics of computer users. In the past, only experts or some technician really wanted to use the computer for special computation. Nowadays, the computer has been transformed into using more like social networks and so on. And finally, um, there is a limitation to frequency scaling on single core. I'm sure everybody is aware of it. And th from an industry point of view, we actually take a different turn as to start increasing the performance via increasing core count. Now, all of these have a number of implications. The first implication is that now you have massive data, now you need a lot of more computing to make those data do meaningful things or come up with meaningful data that you can process them. The second is the birth of multi and many core architecture. Then together, they really drive the need for parallel computing. And we will talk a little bit more about parallel computing in a minute. Questions? All right. So first thing, obviously I want to talk about the good thing first, the opportunities. So you will ask, okay, fine, you do parallel computing, what can it do for us? Um, so in about 89, um, Donald Norman wrote this paper. He described the semantic gap between what um, human conceptual model of problem is and how a machine, at that point a very primitive computer or a calculator, can solve those problems. But there is a big gap between what the human perceives and what the computer can understand. And we term that coin Norman's golf. And essentially, he's saying, you have to iteratively simplify the problem so that down to the level that the computer can understand before it can do some evaluation for you. Once it did some evaluation, it feeds you back with the data that it generated, and you further refine your model, and you, you iteratively go through this gap multiple times until you solve your problem. Well, the main issue there is that the semantic barrier between what as a human wanted to solve as a problem and what the computer can understood is really a big barrier as to um, who can actually use this computer and how available it is to all of us. And of course, you can imagine if you can actually speed up this loop here by reducing the number of iteration you have to do, ideally, you will not even have a, have a gap in between, right? You just go up to the computer and tell it what you want it to, to look for you. And you go search the web, search your database or whatever, and generate the data and even do the analysis for you and just give you an answer. That would be the perfect model that we are shooting for. Now, how do we achieve that? So that's what we believe is what we call the model-driven analytics will do. Now, <coughs> the whole semantics lesson hasn't changed, right? Essentially, you build a model as what you believe is what you're looking for. And then you ask the machine to do those um, either data mining or data harvesting for you and then do the analysis for you. What we believe have changed is that a couple of things. One is, as we increase the amount of data and the availability of the data, mostly driven by the internet as well as the advance in communication, <coughs> you can almost get um, any data 
um, for any problem uh, worldwide, almost in real time. What that, the ability to bring all those data to a computer in, in, in such a short instant, what that means is now you no longer have to rely on heuristic of saying, if you only have limited data, then you're based on the heuristic or based on some existing analytical model and to predict what that model would, might look like. You could actually use the data to generate a very custom version of the model for your problem that you're looking at. And you can use these data in real time to actually help you to train to, to refine your model to get it better. Now let me, let me put this into a like slightly more precise framework. This is the framework what we call the interactive RMS loop. Now what RMS stands for is recognition, mining, and synthesis. It's the term that we use for what we believe as an analytical engine um, the core of an analytical engine. The recognition part mostly deal with the what is question. So such as you, how you build a model. You know, what is this thing? What is a car? A car has four wheels or does it have three wheels? And those goes into your model itself. Then the second part is a mining part, which essentially answers the question, is this belong to the model or does it not belong to the model? Like I said, like suppose our model here was um, a car something that moves people or material from one point to another point. Now, you might you know, describe to it certain, certain characteristic or certain attribute about this particular things you're looking at, and then the, the mining part is essentially helped you find out whether this thing matches the description of your model or not. And if so, then you could actually move on to the last part, which is really a synthesis, answering the what if question. So in a lot of the scenario, even though you can identify the situation, you might want to project out and say, okay, well, if this situation changes, how is it going to affect the, the outcome? And we believe that to solve Norman's goal, if you can embed this whole thing into the interactive loop, essentially iterating over this rec recognition, mining, and synthesis phases can actually help the, the computer solve more human-like problem. Now, let me give you a few examples to drive home what is interactive RMS. The first one would be oops, uh, what future medicine might look like. So, in terms of recognition, here, a question we might want to ask here is, what is a tumor? And based on a lot of medical researchers and so on, they might have a lot of images about tumors, you know, MRI scan, CT scan, or even um, blood tests or whatever. Then based on those multi-model data, the recognition part essentially was building up this model about a tumor. So it, it described the characteristic about the tumor itself, how it, how it would grow, and, and all the information about it. Then the second part is the mining part. Now, essentially this will help get into automated computerized um, or computer-aided medicine. Um, doctors send patients to take MRI scan, blood tests, and so on, it will come back with a lot of these data. Now the question is, can it actually help the doctor, A, the doctor diagnose whether this patient has, has a tumor or not? If so, you know, what type of tumor, how it might be, uh, is it aggressive or not, and how it might progress. And finally, the synthesis part is essentially looking at um, how would the tumor grow over the period of time, or what if you start doing operation on it, how would it heal? Now, so this is one possibility where we see applying the RMS um, analytics into medicine. Okay, now switch to some lighter topic other than talking about tumors. Um, RMS can also be applied in other domains such as entertainment. Now, one example here is supposedly uh, we take, I'm sure most of you have watched this movie Shack. Um, and, you know, what, what, how would we, how we might apply RMS to it? For example, in the recognition part is you might apply, um, you know, doing character recognition first. You know, understanding who is Shaq, who is Fiona, who is Prince Charming, you know, what is the basic storyline. And then the mining part is, you know, you might go in there and say, huh, I remember a scene that have done something such as when does Shaq first meet Fiona's parents? What is his facial expression? Then it could go through the, the movie and then actually pick out that that particular scene for you. And finally, the synthesis part is really really the interesting portion of it. It's like, 
you know, we watch movie, we always wonder, you know, why does the ending have to end this way? What if the ending doesn't end this way? Can it be end differently? And that's kind of answered by the synthesis part, why you can, you can type in questions like, okay, what if um, Shaq was being too late? Um, and things like that, and then it will actually generate a new storyline and actually synthesize um, what that movie might look like. Now again, this is what a lot of really futuristic what entertainment would look like, but again, it, will, it just shows an example of how we can actually apply something like RMS into um, entertainment, into um, medicines, into many other domains. And today I'm just going to talk about these two topics here. Now, so in summary, in terms of opportunity, um, what parallel computing can bring. Number one is, with more data, we can actually start using model-driven analytics a lot more. And with more computing, we can actually drive and, and make interactive RMS loop possible. And ultimately, what both of these come together is lowering the computing barrier, essentially making computer much more friendly, much more useful to human beings. So that's what we see as the opportunity for parallel computing. Uh, questions here? Okay. Now, come to the next part, the challenges, right? Okay, parallel computing is great. Why don't we do it from day one? In fact, we do just do it early on, but later on we switch out. There must be a reason why. So first of all, I guess I don't really need to talk a lot about it. There is a technical reason why we have to go to many core mainly because single, chip, single core design, you reach a frequency limitation, you have a power limitation, and so on, you can't really continue to increase this, the performance of a single die. And therefore, we start splitting into multi-core. And then later on, we switch it further into many-core. The, the goal is that for the same area and power, we can deliver you more performance. Now, let's see how we can get there. Now, obviously, as an uh, Architecture trend, um, there is a rapid increase in computing. Um, I'm only citing Intel processors um, from, from the Halon, which is our first Core i7 processor. <coughs> it has four cores, and then it goes to Westmere, our second Core i7 processor. It has six cores, and around the same time frame, we have our first um, many integrated core prototype, Knights Ferry, which has 32 cores. And then at the same time, the data level parallels are also increasing, going from SSE, which is 128-bit Y, to our latest um, Core i7 processor, which have AVX, which is going to have 256-bit Y, and to something like um, the Knights Ferry, going to have 512-bit Y, CMD. And potentially, we can go further. Now, the main issue is, together with these, there's a clear chance that we definitely could be putting more processor if not more processing power into the, into, the, into the same area and power. The main issue that really comes in here, we do increase memory bandwidth, but typically we can't keep up with the compute increases. In the old days, it used to be one byte per flop. I mean, that's long gone. I haven't seen one byte per flop for a long, long, long time. Um, if you look at some of the modern processor, like Westmere has around 0.2 byte per flop. That's considerably reasonable. Uh, but what is the trend? Um, we're looking at, we're just citing what Bill Daly said at 2009. Um, of GPU at 2017, the byte per flop would drop down to 0.05 byte per flop. Now, what exactly byte per flop tells you is your, your, your bandwidth to compute ratio. So it's, essentially, think about it. You want the processor to do something for you. You need to, you, you want to keep the ALU operated every cycle. So it's munching data. Well. But if you have no locality of these data, and the data has to be brought back from you know, memory, let's, let's not talk about this today, or I.O. Let's just suppose the data is in your memory. You still need to bring them, into, bring them on die so that you can actually process it. So essentially, the byte per flop is a, is a metric that measures you know, what is the ratio. Um, I guess um, in the parallax, um, they actually talks about the uh, compute intensity, or arithmetic intensity. That's another term for byte per flop. So essentially, you look at how much data you bring, how much data you afford to bring in for every byte of computation. You can imagine, as we keep increasing the computation capability of the processor, you do need really increases the same amount of um, memory bandwidth. Otherwise, you won't be able to sustain those computation. And when you cannot sustain the computation, what does that mean? That means you're starving the core. So that's why we call the feeding the bees problem. You have a really hungry bees. 
he's trying to munch on all the data as quickly as possible, but if you can't feed it, essentially what he's doing, he just sit there and wait until your data shows up. Now, so they definitely have a lot of architecture implication there. Okay, so just to give some more concrete examples, so th I'm just comparing two processors, the Core i7 Westmere and the uh, Intel Nice Ferry. So you can actually see, um, I, it does take two socket Westmere to get to around 300 gigaflops of compute versus a single socket Nice Ferry will get to the 1.2 teraflop compute. So there's about 4x ratio in terms of computing capability. But in terms of memory bandwidth, no matter how hard we try, we only get slightly less than 4x. So we're not quite keeping up that ratio. So what that means is the emphasis will, you put a lot more stress on your memory subsystem, how you design your caches and so on to make sure you can, you can continue um, your computation without storing too much. And again, the other implication here, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the features definitely we have to watch out for is the number of cores and number of threads in this system is it's actually increased significantly, right? Going from around 12 on the, in the middle here to around um, 32 on the right side. So it's our 3x increase in there. Okay, so that just set the stage of, you know, we really need parallel computing. So the next part is who is going to program it? I'm sure all of you sitting here is going to write parallel program. Now you might ask, well, what's hard about it? Well, the first question, at least to me, is I don't think in parallel. I don't know how many of you do start thinking about a problem in parallel when you first started. I always think about sequentially how I would solve a problem. Then the second question is, a lot of time parallel alg algorithms are actually after forks. So you first think about how you might possibly do it on a single thread, a single core implementation, and then you thought about, okay, well, how am I going to scale it up? Running yeah, it on. Iverson is not in the audience. Sorry, he would disagree with you. Okay, so I agree. I mean, I, like I said, this is mostly looking at me, right? I'm doing it that way, but I mean, I'm, I'm just a normal human being. <laughs> now, the other thing we observe is that oftentimes a best serial code doesn't always scale well when you have large number of processors. So the blue line will be pretty much what I just described. If you start out, you know, spend a lot of time squeezing out the last bit of performance on your single threaded implementation, and you started converting that, you know, putting OpenMP or whatever you want on it, or your favorite parallel primitives, to make them a parallel application, you typically come up with such a poor scaling, and you find, hmm, what's wrong, <coughs> with, my what's wrong with my program? Then you start spending, you know, then you start you know, hitting yourself too hard and start thinking about, okay, maybe I really should switch to something more like a parallel-friendly application, or parallel-friendly algorithm, and actually redo your whole um, um, implementation. And now, with a, with a better, more parallel-friendly algorithm, you do scale better. I mean, in here, we don't get perfect scaling. We get to around 12. Um, by the way, this is actually one of the algorithms we study when we're doing, like, data mining. This is a frequent item mining in um, algorithm that we actually use this here. Okay, so then, okay, well, so that's the first problem. The second problem is, okay, so let's look at the MDAO's law for multi-core for a minute. Well, multi-core, by and large, is you, you, after we designed a single core, we just stamped it you know, multiple times and put them on the same die. So for a low number of core, up to eight or so, um, this equation pretty much holds true. Essentially what they're saying is you take the parallel portion and you speed them up by n, which is the number of processor, number of, number of processor, number of components in, um, that, that operate on the parallel part, and then you have the scalar portion that are left behind. And what we see is you do need a very decent um, percentage of parallel portion for this application to have some amount of speed up. Now, what's changed for many core is that oftentimes, because we're trying to pack much more processor on the same area, therefore, you actually impacted the processor design. You cannot put all the, you know, even though transistor is literally free, you still can pack all the logics in there to do, you know, like all the superscalar out of order, all the 10 issues or whatever features you have in these big processors. Therefore, what happened is, there's a new component added to this MDOS law equation, which is this K part. Essentially, 
what happened is the serial part now runs on one of these little tiny core. It's going to take a lot longer. Well, not a lot, but somewhat longer. And therefore, the serial portion actually stretched out. So what is the implication of this equation is that for even a, a very minor k, which is 1.5, which just means that this, the small core is about 1.5 times slower than the, the big core, you actually need over 90% efficiency to see any decent, 90% um, parallel portion to actually see some decent speed up on these type of many core processor. So this actually requires more thoughts about you really want to build your application right so that the parallel portion is really dominant. Now, did I scare you about parallel computing yet? Okay, if not, okay, we can continue. So this is the summary about the challenges that I see, right? First of all, um, the architecture is definitely switching over to many core. And, you know, there is a question about compute density versus compute efficiency. And as I mentioned earlier, data management becoming a serious problem. And we really have to spend a lot of effort trying to figure out that out. In terms of algorithm, um, the question there is, is the best scalar algorithm really suitable for parallel computing? If not, then how can we do better? And in terms of programming model, well, I apologize. Well, for people like me, tends to think in, in sequential steps. And how do we actually switch from a sequential thinking into a more parallel thinking as well as driving um, these parallel <coughs> programs going through non-linear coding um, style will be some of the challenges. OK, so come down to the last part, which is how we approach this type of problem. So we'll describe, you know, what is the motivation, why we need to do a lot of parallel computing, you know, what are the opportunity, what are the challenges. Now this is at least our approach to solving this problem is doing application specific hardware software code design. So we essentially look at application and look at architecture as a whole. Um, you start from the top where we actually gather a lot of focused workloads. We can analyze all the workloads in the world. But we do spend a significant amount of time analyzing each of the workloads, <coughs> understanding the requirements. And then based on those requirements, we actually drive down the stack, both the programming environment, the execution environment, the OS, the firmware, <coughs> down to the memory subsystem, the whole um, platform architecture. And once we have these kind of features, then we start um, going back and using the, and then back validating that and see, given this particular platform, so you start with app, uh, workloads, we change to what the platform might look like. With the platforms, now we go back and re-examine the workload and see if the current, if this particular algorithm we pick at the beginning is still the best for this type of platform. If not, then we have to reiterate. So here, like I said, the, the bonus point that we haven't quite understand and we haven't quite figured out is how do we simplify the programming part? How can we make parallel program easy and at the same time you can get very good performance out of it? Now in summary, these are pretty much the steps that we, we've taken, right? First, we took the algorithm behind the application. We analyzed the characteristic of the, of the algorithms itself. Um, then you, you take each of those um, kernels evaluate the sensitivity to the various architecture parameters. And now that we understand, for example, if the kernel will only scale with um, process uh, with computation, or if the kernel only scale with bandwidth increases, or if the kernel will scale with cache <coughs> sizes and so on. So after we build up this knowledge about the sensitivity of various architecture parameter, then we can finally build an architecture storm. And like I said earlier, once we finish building up the, the straw man, we ran this application on it and we collect data and trying to understand are there any adjustments that we can make to the algorithm so that you will run better on this particular platform. And then if, if needed, we will repeat this loop multiple times. Now, so you might ask, well, that's a lot of work to be done on a very specific application and there are you know, millions of interesting applications out there. How would you do it? Now the question, so our, sort of our answer was, you know, we rely on this thing called workload convergence. Because without it, you know, despite Intel, the size of Intel, we still can't hire ex enough expert programmer to do all of those steps. 
And so what, what, what happened is over the last five years or so, we analyzed a large number of these emerging RMS type applications and trying to understand what are the mathematical models behind each one of them and whether they actually converge or down into um, basic solvers and basic computing primitives. And for at least a large class of these RMS applications, I'm happy to say that they do converge into a subclasses of these, um, for example, iterative solvers, direct solvers, as well as these um, um, computation primitives. And now that we have this framework understanding how, we c how these applications can be broken down into these primitives as well as kernels, we can now spend a lot of our efforts building up libraries or specialized version of these um, primitives as well as solvers so that we can actually go back and help all the, ex all the applications on the top there. Okay, so now I'm going to go through a few examples about you know, how we actually apply this um, application architecture code design methodology. So the first one is what we call a 3D sensor operation. Essentially things that you find inside, um, well, like lattice simulations and so on. So what we did is we took this we take the scale of um, the serial code. We start with that, and we apply <coughs> simplification to use the vector unit. And at the same time, we apply all the threading that's in there. So this gives us somewhere around 4x speed up. You know, the 4y simd give us around 2x, and then using all the threads, all the processor inside the core, we get another 2x. Now the non-blocking, so if you just take the scalar version of the code, which works on a relatively large data set, tends to be um, bandwidth bound because you work on large data and you don't have enough computation, as I mentioned earlier, the byte flops, right? Because your working set is relatively small and you can only reuse the data for a few times. And therefore, you need to frequently bring in new data to, to operate your processor. So then you become bandwidth bound. So what we did is we performed what we call the cache blocking or two and a half D spatial and one D temporal. So essentially, we take the large 3D grids and break them into smaller cells. And you actually pipeline. You can think of it as an extreme software pipelining that, of, that actually span over multiple processors. And with this, um, the blocking optimization give us another 1.7x. And because of that, now if you block it into your caches, you have a lot more reuses and you drastically reduces your byte per flop. And now you become compute bound. And because it become compute bound, then it actually allows you to scale further with all the processor inside the chip. And that gets you the 1.8x. And finally, this is if we actually improve it um, further by restructuring the code a little bit more, doing it um, with better SIMD locality, we actually get another 1.9x. So the, the total end result is that based on starting from something like a scalar code, um, after you apply all the optimization, you got somewhere around 20x speed up in this particular cases, and that's published in our 2010 uh, supercomputing paper. If you want to read, you can read more about this. Okay, so the second case is FFT. Again, FFT is a very interesting algorithm. Here, there's algorithm choices, for example, based on from starting from a Radix 2 implementation to a Radix 4 implementation, we already see a 1.7x um, scaling in there. The trade-off there is that you need a lot more temporary register so that you can hold all the data while you're actually doing your computations. And then we start going from um, the, the single core implementation to multi-threaded, multi-core implementation that get us around 3x. Now where the other roughly around 2x come from is mostly due to now you do. Now FFT itself is actually a very difficult application where it's mostly bandwidth bound. You know, no matter how you block, there's almost no way you can actually block the data. I mean, you can, you can take a few of the stages and combine them, and, and hopefully they will work locally without spilling out back into memory, but it's still very difficult. So, so you can see, no matter how we do it, uh, we only get roughly another 2 to 3x more scaling on FFT here. So the overall scaling here, it's around 10x. Okay, so the third one, was there a question? Okay. Um, the third one was actually sparse matrix vector multiplication. Um, in this particular case, the sparse access pattern is, makes it very difficult. The multi-threading was nice in a way that 
because of the multiple threads, you can actually start hiding some of the latency. This one is essentially latency bound when you first started it, because you actually really don't know where you're going until you get, the, you get your data, you get your index. And therefore, essentially, you spend a lot of time in the scalar code waiting for the data to show up. So this becomes more or less a, a latency bound application. And the issue here is that when you do um, naive, um, um, when you, when you do naive partitioning, the issue is that in a sparse matrix, typically, unless it's a structure sparse problem, um, the number of non-zero entries per row is actually non-deterministic. And so if you just randomly, just say you have 100,000, if you have 100,000 row, and you just partition it statically to all the processor here, some of the processor might end up getting two or five X more work than any other processor, then you run into a low imbalance problem. And with low imbalance problem, essentially you're just telling some of the processor that, okay, well, all you do is do one, uh, one computation and then you can go to sleep. Now, so the, the more intelligent partitioning is essentially a low balance method. Essentially, you, you, t you count the total number of non-zeros and then you go and divide the total number of non-zeros with number of threads and you stop only until you're done with your portion. Now there, you, you end up with potentially multiple threads or multiple core working on the same row at the same time. The, the implication there is then you will start introducing um, synchronization or atomic operation in there to make sure the data you, you do is, co is correct. Um, so some other s small improvement is again using simplification. Simplification for sparse operation is very difficult mainly because the random access Right. You, for SIMD to work well, you literally need to bring the data in sort of consecutive data. The data better lay out next to each other so that you can actually load them all together. Um, so the term we use there is what we call gather scatter. Um, the ability to do gather the data from random location into a contiguous location or register is actually the critical part to enable um, simplification. And we are working very hard to make sure our future processor will have that kind of capability. And cache blocking do help a little bit, again, because um, the, the typical matrix vector operation is it's bandwidth one, right? The, you, you bring in two, a bunch of data and you only do very little computation. And the, the doing blocking in this case has helped a little bit, but doesn't help a lot. For example, you bring in a block of a block of your matrix and then you actually ran through multiple indexes over that same block of matrices. Okay, so the speed up there was 6x. Now the next question, the next example here we looked at is what we call the graph traversal. Now for this particular problem, it's really the efficient layout is really important. Um, you really need to lay out the data structure in the correct way. Otherwise, you again, you get into the same indirect access type of pattern, which will really hurt your performance there. And I guess I'm not gonna go, I mean, a lot of the other stuff we have talked about briefly. Okay, so the last one I'm going to talk about, or actually this is not the last one, there's one more after this. This one is tree search. Um, the tree search, I think the, again, tree search and the graph problem is very similar in a sense that a lot of time when you, when you started the, the search, um, you really don't know where you're going. So therefore, you have a very large tree. One of the problems we find into is that you could take left and right branches for every single um, node in the tree there. Then the issue is you'll be traversing, other than the, other than the very, uh, the root part of the tree that you almost go through all the time, when you get down to the leaves itself, it's almost always not in your caches. And, and then the other problem in modern processor that we find um, troublesome, it's actually the, the TLB itself. Um, because the tree is typically large. I mean, when we're talking about database trees, we're talking about at least 128 million entries in here. So those are pretty large tree. And for those tree, um, imagine the, num the type of page table we have um, for virtual memory. I mean, if you have 4K pages, that means you really have a lot of those 4K pages. And as you go down the tree itself, you actually start hitting, um, what you, when you go from one level to the next level, you realize that you actually need to have a page miss. And in modern processor, actually TLB misses is actually very expensive. And that's actually hurting us much more than, um, than the cache misses itself. 
I mean, a cache misses on average is maybe, well, okay, a couple hundred cycles, but the page misses itself could also be a few hundred cycles. So you don't want to pay the penalty twice. So for this particular paper, what we did is actually we did this thing called page blocking. So essentially we organized the data structure so that you take the tree, you take each part of the subtree and organize them into a page itself. So that for each page, at least you get multiple levels in your tree traversal. So until you, you ran out of these four or five levels, you won't have a page miss. So that kind of amortizes the, the page miss penalty that you will be paying. And then for this one, we got 30x speed up. Okay, so the last case here, this is the matrix multiplication. So essentially, I think the, the key here, I mean, matrix multiplication, that's why you, you might think it's a very simple, you know, like four line of C code, but to, to get an optimal performance on, on matrix multiplication, we actually spend many, many, many years of engineering time to come up with the better versions of it. Um, and then in here, the, the loop inversion was basically the main thing that we're trying to get to. Um, the optimization that we use to actually get good performance out of it. Okay, so, <coughs> well, after going through all these examples, sorry, I went through it relatively quickly. Um, so I want to get to the learning part. You know, what is the, what optimization really does pay off the most? So in our, in our point of view, um, the parallel algorithm really offer um, the best speed up effort ROI. So yes, you might spend hours thinking about how to write parallel code, but you know, as I said, you know, if you start with a scale code or best serial code, that may not give you the best performance. I mean, that may not give you best scalability. So you really have, need to think about parallel algorithm. Secondly is what we believe the technology aware algorithmic improvement is really the next best um, ROI. It's essential you look at, okay, well, you know, what is the technology look like? So as we know, the trend is that you're gonna get more and more processor, you're gonna get more and more threats. And so then at the same time, your compute density will continue to go up, but at the same time that your, your bandwidth is not gonna be going up as fast. So your algorithms or your implementation that understanding <coughs> these kind of trend or these kind of technology und um, under, under print will really help you get the next opportunity now the next step is saying, okay, well, from, from our point of view, this is really, the next one is really understanding um, the, the locality, getting your data blocked so that you won't be bandwidth bound as much as you can. And this is for us, you know, to process it with caches and so on, def definitely an important component to it. And then finally, when you get down to the architecture specific speed up, like, you know, I'm optimizing for this particular CPU or I'm optimizing for this particular GPU. Then it's really, I would think it's actually the very last thing that you really wanted to do. I mean, but of course, I mean, there are company out there, They're, they they really aren't want to focusing on squeezing the last ounce of the performance on their processor and they will do these kind of architecture specific optimization. But generally the guideline that we see is that for a given, for given, for two given architecture, right? You look at the the compute ratio, you look at the bandwidth ratio. That kind of bounded, you know, where that scaling or the performance ratio between them is. So, with that, I want to summarize. Um, so, today we talk about you know like the massive data computing. Essentially, as I, as I motivated at the beginning. Um, because of the digital revolution, we now have a lot more digital data and there will be a lot more massive data that we have to compute. And because of that data, we do want to do more things with it. You know, we don't want to just keep archiving these data onto this. I mean, then, you know, I don't know how good that is. But once you gather these data, like you took all these pictures, you do want to process them somehow. And with that, basically that actually allow us to, well, you can think of it as, you know, the continuing, um, finding the killer apps that actually drive the development of computer architecture. So we think that the massive data is really the next driving force of our next generation architecture. The second part is really the uh, algorithmic opportunity. Um, we really have to switch out from you know, the serial mode of thinking. We really have to understand more about you know, how best to actually program in parallel, think in parallel. Now, having said that, you know, I haven't given up the hope of saying 
Uh, can, can you hold on one second? I'm almost done. When I'm done, I can take questions. Um, um, so I have, personally, I haven't given up, uh, given up hope that you can start with sc um, scalar code and actually have some smart compilers, smart framework, automatic framework that actually helps you convert that scalar code into somewhat decent or somewhat efficient parallel program. Now that's, you know, you can think of it as my dream, but I haven't quite given up that dream yet. So we'll continue to work on that. Um, so the last part is really the performance challenge. Like, as I said, you know, the, the, main, the, the main issue is, um, here the main issue I really want to highlight is really this memory subsystem problem. Because, you know, it's much easier, well, at least from my point of view, I think it's much easier for us to pack more computing capability, to pack more ALUs on the die, than to add the pin bandwidth so that I can bring in the memory um, and the memory data from the from memory into processors. So that's all. With that, thank you. I take some questions. Yes. Uh, so let me this question by, by saying that it's not a trick question. Okay. Um, what is there that is algorithmic about your about parallel? Okay. Can you elaborate a little bit more about it? So yeah, I mean, you're you're trying to encourage people to start thinking in parallel and not serial. I see. But what is there that is algorithmic? What problem is solved except for the obvious pragmatics uh -huh. of parallel decomposition? What is there that is intrinsically uh, algorithmic about parallelism? I guess You're asking people to think about parallel mm -hmm. algorithms, right? Right, I understand, I understand. I'm, I'm trying to think in my mind how to distinguish you know, the, the scalar algorithm versus the parallel algorithm itself. <coughs> So I guess you know it has to do with you know when you do the domain decomposition, how much synchronization you normally take into account. Like if okay. Um, different. It's the same question from a different direction. Okay. And um, what is the about an algorithm that is inter inherently concurrent because an algorithm, even the pure definition of an algorithm, is a sequential concept. Right. Uh, so, uh, maybe does, does anybody know of a parallel algorithm? Uh, yes. Please, please elaborate. Okay. Well, I, go ahead. I've got a different one, but it's the same one. It's just different, different language. Go ahead. So I have a friend, he's a biophysicist, he runs a program, uh, he runs a model, it's a diffusion model, he's got n number of cells arranged in n number of rows, n number of columns, every, um, every machine cycle, and each cell performs a simple function, and it exchanges its result with its neighbors, and it gets the results from its neighbors, and the next machine cycle, it does it again. And that is a fundamentally parallel algorithm. It's certainly the case that there is parallel, there is concurrency in biophysics. But what is intrinsically algorithmic? What problem is it solving? The it's, it's, it's a diffusion model. Yeah, I, I understand. And <coughs> it is, it is a lot of concurrency, and it is parallel. Just to say, as a, as a person who um, cited Timothy Patterson, um, Bob Hoyt produced a memo back in the about early 1990s. You're welcome to take a look at my database, and you can search on the title of his, his memo, which has something like, I don't know, 600 references, is titled Parallel Numerical Algorithms. That's really the numeric side, okay? We won't get too much of the non-numeric side for a moment. So they involve terms like, I'm going to just use a couple of terms here. Domain decomposition is a typical one. Uh, he hasn't used the, the phrase we in the numeric community call 
embarrassingly parallel, which is, you know, if you've got some big problem, like say payroll processing, you do the A through M's in one, on one machine, just use a two case, and the N through Z's on a Yeah, on I'm, not dispu I'm not disputing decomposition. Right. And I just gave, I just gave domain decomposition merely as one parallel algorithm. There are people who concentrate solely on parallel FFTs, um, both in the, in the classified and unclassified community, <laughs> as an example. And look, it's just a general, you know, the FFT is, is such a brilliant, you, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, the FFT is, well, throw an FFT at it as an example. It really comes out as an example. So, um, I mean, I'm not sure how many parallel algorithms you'd like to cite. Parallel search is a common one. I could, I could tell you. I mean, that's, that's, that's simple decomposition well, see, by the same algorithm. You know, Steve, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'm not objecting to you. I'm just letting you know what my read of the literature for the past six, six decades is. You know, without telling you that there's something over 100,000. I, 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 know, I know that people use the phrase. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I object to it as well, too. I think, I think parallelism is, is overwhelming overwrought for on a number of levels. But you know, if you want specific answers, you know, I, I'm your man throughout throughout the world. <laughs> just 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 open up a crack, crack open Tennessee and Patterson and go back to the acknowledgments or the Okay, so but from a practical point of view though, you're you're accepted. <laughs> Maybe the speaker can answer the question. Well thanks. Okay, let me let me try to I mean agree um, at this point, I cannot think of you know the the main difference between um, how you would do it differently, um, a, a zero algorithm versus a parallel algorithm. All I can think of is the algorithm that is more immutable for parallel um, architecture, right? Depending on how you decomposition, how you break down the problem, some problem will mix it runs better or scale better on parallel architecture. And in our mind, that's what we will call a parallel algorithm. But then, you know, that may not match, you know, the, the definition of what you would call a semantically a, a parallel algorithm. But generally speaking, you know, in the way we think about it is maybe I should I should change the term and saying that is you should develop algorithms that are more parallel friendly in a sense that you should be aware of all these parallel architecture issues, such as if you don't, for example, you take an application. Um, you could, for example, you can do data decomposition and then you can just break it down and do parallel computation. Or you can do functional decomposition and say, okay, well, all of these processes will involve doing one particular function and at the end you exchange your data and then before you move on. Um, so both of those phases, um, depending on the particular algorithm, one may be more amiable for parallel computing than the other. And so I think so in our, in, our, in our mind, or the way we want to pitch it, is that you, know, you definitely want to develop algorithms that are more immutable for our parallel architecture. Yes? The history of our processors has been the triumph of the general purpose over the special purpose. OK. So do you think that the GPU could disappear in six to 10 years uh, on the phones and the tablets and the laptops just plain disappear, replaced by a couple of big cores for the legacy applications and a sea of small SMP general purpose cores, and that's the end of trying to program these damn GPUs. <laughs> I'm sure that is a loaded question. <laughs> okay, let me try to take the politically correct way of answering it. <laughs> um, well, the, I mean, let's look at it this way. Um, I mean, very specialized processors, such as GPUs, um, they definitely have their edge over general processor on certain applications, right? I mean, otherwise they won't exist. Probably might disappear. Right. Um, now the question really is, is if you look at the trend of the development, um, well, this is actually more economic discussion, I would think, yes. because you know you are specialized in a particular area or specialized in a particular application, you do well. But once you get to you know 99% of the market share, you know nobody else wanted to do any more with that market, and you own the whole market, then 
you, don't, you cannot make any more money out of it. So you will have to switch over and you need to start looking at other domains, right? Now, obviously the, the logical things to do is you start by going into other applications that you know, have very similar characteristics to the ones that you do very well. And you're trying to take those over. But the more the more you do, then basically these specialized processor, you also need to start generalize them a little bit, right? Because you know, the problems are not exactly the same. In order for you to take on one more domain, you need to start adding things. You know, I'm citing, for example, in GPU, they start adding double precision computation into their, into their GPU framework. No, not that g graphics really need double precision computation. It's mainly because they really want to start, you know, looking at other applications that might need double precision computation. Now, if you take that trend forward, you know, if you're trying to really generalize the GPU, then it becomes more and more like a CPU. So I would not disagree that at some, at some point in the future, the, the general purpose processor and a, G, a specialized processor like GPU will, will converge in some sense, right? But you know, the, the model you propose, like a heterogeneous, um, archit heterogeneous architecture, well, yeah. right, where you have some of these plus some of the others, which is certainly a, I mean, I would say a very popular or very serious contender in this space here, right? Because you, you do recognize that actually a lot of our processor today actually have special like video codec in there. It's just because that to doing video de um, decoding and encoding, these codec are like <coughs> thousand times much more power and area efficient than general purpose processor. There's actually no way you can actually replace them. And they're such, so they're such a tiny thing. Um, and then, well, and then the other trend is that transistors are becoming free, right? I mean, very soon we have 10 billion transistors on a, on a die. You might as well sprinkle a few of these specialized processors there to do certain things for you. Yes, but... Yeah, just, let's just sharpen the question slightly. Can the GPU even hang on to the graphics market? Now, admittedly, Laramie didn't quite take it for them at the first thing. But this is a long-term siege, you know. Sure. Intel will be back. <laughs> yes. So can they even hold on to the graphics market going forward? Mm. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I don't have an answer for that okay. either. Yes, that was a second. I think what you may be saying is that, you know, like a mitochondria absorbed into the bigger cell, the GPU would just become an okay. Like yeah. you know, it could become one, of, one of the specialized units inside this really gigantic chip. So speaking of the use, of the core. Some of the things in the algorithm, the uh, RMS paradigm that you talked about, uh, I think would require a different kind of U, and that's the MRU, the mm -hmm. magical rainbow unit. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of this. Is that true? Sure. I mean, are these examples like anywhere <coughs> in the realm of AI capability right. at all, or is this is that kind of like, wow, well, wouldn't that be neat? But let's talk about the science. Yeah. Stuff. Well, so there, there's certainly a lot of. Okay, so I mean. This is a philosophical issue that we have to deal with, right? On one hand, you have all these specialized units that we can build, and admittedly, they are definitely a lot more efficient than, than the general purpose um, processor. The other issue that we more and more get into is that um, validation is actually becoming a serious design issue. You know, not just the design itself. You know, we can go in and design very complex architecture um, that's not a problem at all. And we can prove that, well, if you give me this architecture, I can easily give you 2x performance. But what ends up killing these kind of architecture features is really the validation um, time and expenses. And the issue with you know, going to the heterogeneous architecture is that now you're going to have many, many of these unique units on the chip. And basically, each one of them will require individual validation time. And so that's actually, again, you know, if you go back to the economic part of it, right, from a, from a, from a, com from a chip company perspective, you know, we're always spending a lot of money in validation. You know, are we, at some point, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I don't know the data, and at some, I'm just guessing that at some point, you don't want the validation, the, the money you spend on validation more than the money you spend on design. Yes? So your point about validation is very, very, very good. On the data side, there's a similar problem characterized by metadata. 
-hmm. So in your example about tumors, how do we know that Sorry. the data we're looking at it relates to a tumor? Right. What does it mean to be a tumor? Mm -hmm. So how do <coughs> Oh, yeah, there's this massive world of data out there, but right, right. now it's not described very well, so mm -hmm. it's not very usable. Right. Yeah, so there, there's a large research going on in this multi-model um, database, as well as how you search it and how you compare, right? I mean, I mean in, you know, the, the little strains, you can easily compare, it. okay, here's a number, find me this number. But, you know, like you're saying, in some of these multi-model things, right, you know, I mean, let's not talk about tumor, right? But, but for example, even pictures, right? I mean, over the last 10 years or so, I'm sure you accumulate over thousands of pictures that you have taken. You know, one day you might just want to say, huh, I remember a certain day I seen this guy, but I, I don't remember his name, I don't remember his face. You know, by describing that, you know, that semantic is not matching any of the feature that you will find in a picture. You know, how would you search that kind of database? That becomes an issue. And then the other problem I think we get into a lot of, I think this has become much more serious in the, in the, in the computation medicine area is the false positive, or the false negative case, which is currently what's killing these kind of automation, right? What happened is, you know, you don't want to be wrong. So therefore, you, you tend to err on the, on the safe side by saying, oh, this guy, this guy remotely looks like he has a tumor. Let's take him, go through all the tests and figure out what's wrong. And it ends up that, you might have 90% of these false negative. I mean, they're really not having anything, but you worry about him and they, they take him through all sorts of trauma, going through all sorts of tests and find out, okay, well, he's really okay. And that's what's causing the problem here. And then the doctors are actually discrediting this. Now this is becoming an issue here because the guys who are really trying to develop these kind of application to help are really not resisting <coughs> using them. And that becoming a, um, a, u a usability problem. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we'll start with you. Okay, to go a little different direction from something you mentioned, you said that people think serially. Okay. And uh, I'm going to take dispute, uh, dispute that. I think from working with undergrads and kids, I think humans think very easily in parallel. Okay. But CS curriculum very carefully <laughs> 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 Yeah. of very sequential thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Terminology of loops yeah. and for oh, loops. And all our terminology, all our courses, we think of databases as serializable. I see. Why? Um, you know, all, all of our curriculum, all of our courses, and maybe in a graduate course, you will be taught to think of a problem right. from the, and think of it as a parallel yeah. problem to start and develop an algorithm. Well, that's because like a guy who has an office on the fourth floor, he wrote this very successful three volume series of books. <laughs> it gets a lot of money off of it. No, no, no. But, it's a graduate level thing where we teach this. Right. So some universities are playing around with, you know, uh, starting more parallel early. So by maybe, you know, by 2020, should we start teaching undergrads to think parallel? Is, is that too soon? Um, you know, well, when will we... Well, I don't think kindergarten... I think we, <laughs> yeah. teach, we do teach decomposition. We do teach uh, regular decomposition and functional decomposition. I mean, people yeah. are that's not, that's got to go. That's but good. it's in a very serial focused, it, uh, even all the terminology, it's very hard to even use words. That no, that depends, I think that depends on which department. Uh, and I'll give you <laughs> an example. No, seriously. The C CS departments are, you are right, basically largely serial. Mm -hmm. and departments that are not serial, the ones who are really forcing, they're called, not computer science, they're called computational science departments. <laughs> <laughs> okay? And or they're called physics departments. And they're teaching their students. Yes, they, they have to teach their physics students these things because that's the only way they're going to solve these problems. Yeah. Except yeah. to teach them Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> don't so uh, don't think underestimate that. That killed Danny Holtz's company. Just teasing you. So uh, what do you think of building this approach of thinking into the curriculum and kind of like you're not a single core. No mm -hmm. one in entering as a freshman in CS will ever see a single core machine again in their lives. So well, well, I when certainly do we make the switch? Sure, I certainly will encourage it, but I mean, you know, like I said, I'm not really in a good position of saying yes or no, but at the same time, I agree with you, actually I start thinking more, and also with um, the question at the beginning, right, you know, what is the definition of a parallel algorithm itself, you know, I agree, you know, maybe as a kid you start off initially start thinking, well, maybe this is a lot of the training, right, that we've gone through, you know, over the 
over the years <coughs> of life that you start telling the kids, okay, well, you really have to do things sequentially. And they start, tend to start thinking it that way. Now, I'm not sure, you know, obviously I think it will be a good idea to, to, to teach people uh, more parallel program from the beginning. Maybe it will be easier for them to switch over to parallel algorithms. But, I mean, I don't know. Yes? I think Amdahl's law is wrong. Okay. That in, <laughs> in naturally occurring systems, there is no sequential part. For example, right. if you consider the traffic system of Silicon Valley, which we know very well, <laughs> there's no, if it's working, there's no sequential part, right? You, sure. you can't point to say, right here, right, right in front of the Stanford Oval, oh, well, that's the sequential part, okay, of the traffic system. It's just not true. There is no sequential part, right? Sure. And that's true of basically that's, all naturally occurring true. systems. So that's, very true. so that's that's the wrong way to analyze these right. systems. But I think probably the zero way is easier to explain things. So that's probably why, I don't know, I'm just guessing that's probably the reason why we teach people that way, right? But you can't think of it that way and get anywhere. Sure, I agree. Uh. <laughs> 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 I'd like to know um, if there's an issue with the logic or the formalism of reasoning about serial versus parallel and provability or whatever. I think that's clearly right. There is a problem. Okay. I mean, I can simply prove something serial does whatever. Great. So I'm happy because I'm a logician. <laughs> but, you know, in the real world, and in synchronous systems, it's a problem, right? Async, and how do you get things to work? Right. Pure, well, purely, the problem is uh, a lot, large part of our problem. First off, we're Indian blindman, right? Let's, let's acknowledge. We're all trying to describe the elephant. And there's lots of dead bodies this before. I mean, even before I got out of high school, Ken Iverson was trying to push APL, and you know, control data was trying to push the Star 100 over at Lawrence Livermore. And that, I mean, people's, I, I, I some of the best people's careers have been burned, as an example. But APL's, APL's a serial language. Yeah, but it was Ken's attempt. I, I'm not going to try to defend Ken. I mean, I only had a tiny bit of exposure to APL when I, when I was a frosh. Santa Barbara. Uh, the problem is, in many respects, we're attempting to ask. Uh, doing things serially, I, I've watched people attempt to struggle to do things serially. There's a lot of people who cannot manage to do things serially. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.